Hello and welcome to the Culture Books Podcast. I'm your host, John. I'm joined in the pod by... Sheridan! And this is chapter one of The Player of Games. So this is a read-along podcast if you're new to the game. So we expect you to have uh, purchased a copy of, in this case, Ian M. Banks' The Player of Games and uh, read chapter one. And if you haven't done that, then um, just trot off and do that and come back. Uh, and uh, on that basis of that, so Sheridan, um, we finished the first book of the culture novels, um, Consider Phlebas, and then we launched into the play of games and discovered that each of the chapters is nearly 100 pages long. Yes. Which so if is you why it's taken a little while. So if you are one of those people trotting off to buy it, it'll be a long time before you come back and listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> If you're one of those people, yes. Although some people can read 100 pages a little quicker than others. Um, so, this is the play of games. And interestingly, because Consider Phlebas, there was um, a long prelude. There was dedications. There was quoting of, um, and misquoting, which was really interesting, of um, Islamic scripture. Uh, it was a quite... You know, we basically devoted a whole episode before we even got started with the book. In this one, there's nothing. There's the title page. There's the table of contents. Um, there's a bunch of other science fiction authors saying how great Ian M. Banks is, which obviously we agree with. That's why we're doing this series. Um, and then we are just straight into it of one of these four enormous chapters. Um, so, but before we get into it, you know what you're going to have to do, Sheridan? I'm going to have to do my summary of the chapter in... One minute. One minute? Or is it 30 seconds? I think you've got 30 seconds. Uh-oh. I mean... <laughs> it's 125 pages or something. Yeah, I mean, I'm literally just setting the timer now. We could give you a minute, but I don't think we no, will. No, no, we won't. Um, I've got, so. it. got it down. Okay, so take off in three, two, one. We're following Gerge, who's a really massively excellent game player. He's played games for a long time. He's famous. Um, he's a bit bored. He has a drone called Chamless who decides that he's going to contact the contact to get them to contact <laughs> Gergay <laughs> to see if they can do something for him to make him more interested. Then he plays a game of Stricken where he cheats because a evil drone called Maran Skell convinces him to and then Maran Skell blackmails him and tries to get him back. Ah. I mean, if you hadn't said contact six times, you probably would have had time. Yeah, I got more. really, really <laughs> confused there. All right, so can I just finish? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, he, he agrees. Um, so he, Maran Skell blackmails him and on condition to try and get him back into the contact unit. And, um, so in order to do that, he has to agree to play this game called Azad in a very far off place. That's it. Yes. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) That was not your best work. No, Um, it wasn't. (laughs) Okay, I'm just going to read the opening paragraph because um, it is portentous. This is the story of a man who went far away for a long time just to play a game. The man is a game player called Gerge. The story starts with a battle that is not a battle and ends with a game that is not a game. Me, I'll tell you about me later. This is how the story begins. Um, So what did you make of the whole introduction? Um, Well, I assume... The battle that's not a battle is the first game that he's playing with Yay. Basically laser tag. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't find out who the narrator is in this chapter. In this chapter? No. Um, um, I, the, sorry. Yeah. Well, I guess the one can assume that mm-hmm. the game that he ends up playing at the end is um, Azad mm-hmm. and that it might not be a game. Now, I've had an interesting thought. How do we know Gergay is good at games? He says he is. Yeah. Or the narrator does. Yeah. But in this chapter, he sucks at laser tag. He fails, uh, he loses a game to some rando on the train. Uh, and then he ends up cheating to... Um, he was going to win that game, though. Yes, but he does ha- he does cheat in it as well. Well, they keep trying to get him to be a professor at this school. Yeah, no, I'm not saying he's not good at games, but they, in in this chapter, he doesn't actually. Yeah, be, he's not. He's not he, really demonstrating. <laughs> it, is he? he isn't good at games, and um, he's very bad at the laser tag. Uh, we get introduced to Yay, uh, and I want to talk about her a little bit. Just this intro paragraph. 
She had the face of a beautiful child, but the slow, deep voice was knowing and roguish, a low-slung voice. I think Ye is one of the earliest manic pixie dream girls of literature. Can I just say something, though? Mm-hmm. When he sleeps with... The other girl. The other girl. His name we can't remember. Yeah. Ren, maybe? Yeah. Um, She's disposable. When um, Maren's girl shows the video of them mm. together, mm-hmm. he calls her my child. Mm. So it's a bit creepy. Yeah, but he, I mean, Ye won't let him sleep with her. Because part of Ye... Ye he definitely wants he to wants sleep to. with her. He wants to. But I, I like the way that Ye knows that she will lose all interest to him if she sleeps with him. And that she's got some um, you know, cards uh, or hand by holding out. And also, Ye's got other things going on in her life. You know, she's got a new boyfriend she's jetting off two other star systems with, you know. Um... I, uh, I've just found Ye, particularly for the 1980s when this book was written, an interesting character. And she also doesn't really seem to be too suckered in by him because, you know, he, like, tries to get her to be his protege and she's, like, just sort of flatters him. So mm. maybe she knows he's not a very good game player either. <laughs> she's certainly better at the game she's playing with him. Yeah. yeah. Um, having said that, she is obviously enjoys his friendship. Yeah. Um, well, she's getting something from the relationship too, because he is obviously teaching her. Well, and he's very famous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and one thing this chapter really does is it's the first time in these books that you're getting a real interior view of the culture. Consider Phlebas was very much um, exterior views, and this is this is living on a big culture orbital. Um, there's no war going on. Everyone's just getting on with their lives. And what was your take on that? Well, there's a section of the chapter where part of his boredom is because he says, well, we're not living in a heroic age Mm. and no one individual can influence anything Mm. because they have everything, which was quite a... I would argue it's a mistake to think that one individual can be that influential either in any age. But But uh, if you contrast it to consider Phlebas, mm. where whores are... Um, obviously, there's a lot of people in that story, but yeah. he it, it, that is a story about a single person mm. having this impact. Yeah, I mean, I would argue one, you know, I mean, he was basically a um, bioengineered weapon, um, <laughs> you know, and also he died and even the best estimate of, you know, the influence he was going to have on the war was maybe it lasting three months longer or, or less. Mm. Um, so, and... Yeah, it, it, but Horsa was definitely influential to the mind that um, you know he was involved in trying to capture because um, it took his name. Yeah, um, you know, yeah. I, I think it would be unrealistic for it. It's always unrealistic for anyone to think they're going to be that personally influential. We're much more powerful when we uh, work with other um, people to achieve things um, than we can ever be on our own. Uh, and I think Ian M. Banks definitely is trying to get that point across to us. Gerge is, Gerge is definitely a flawed protagonist, a hugely flawed protagonist. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of this chapter is unfolding all of his flaws and failings. Yeah, I mean, it's a specifically, like, humanoid trait to, even if you're living in this perfect existence, mm. to need or want to have something more. I think they show us in this how it's not a perfect existence, though. Why isn't it perfect? Well, you've definitely got you've got the misbehaving drone. Yeah, but that, these are like that's a that's a trivial inconvenience. And you've got it, its friend, the um, gunboat diplomacy, the um, limited offense unit in in contact that's trying to get it back into contact. So sorry, maybe I misspoke. So he pauses life. Pauses life. Oh, sorry. Gerge's, Gerge's life mm-hmm. is. Um, You know, he's living in a utopia. He has everything he needs. Mm. Living in a utopia. And one thing I did love about this chapter was it felt very much like the energy at being a a Burning Man event. (laughs) 
Like people, know, but, uh, people are that's people come are, left field for people me. are doing whatever they want to do. They're rushing around, but then it's like, hey, we're going to have a big party over here. So and so is leaving the planet, uh, and then you've got people getting their dirigible out, you know, a giant airship out and sailing it over to be part of the fun. Um, you know, not because they even know him or like him, but just because they want to show off. Hey, look at my giant airship. Um, you know, and and it's it's <laughs> people just rushing around doing whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do, however they want to do. Um, but in the most cool and extravagant way possible yeah. to try and impress each other because impressing each other is the only currency they have. Yeah. Which is partly what it reminds me of uh, Burning Man events where it's all about gifting culture and basically trying to be the most flamboyantly generous person there, mm. which doesn't work when billionaires start crashing the events. <laughs> but um, Well, I guess it does, but to a limited degree. Um, but, uh, yeah, I... So, yeah, it is an idyllic existence, although obviously Gergé's bored of it, and you can tell that Ye's got a pretty um, jaded view of this, um, just how boring it is to live in heaven. Yeah. Uh, and But then you have got these dark undercurrents going on. Um, you know, what's the name of the, the bad drone again? Sorry, Morum Skell. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, let, let's talk a minute about his... I don't know if he's bad. He's evil. How do you... Positively evil. He holds Gergay down and forces his mouth open so rain falls into it and um, Gergay is drowning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <all right>. <laughs> <laughs> he's, okay. <laughs> he's absolutely terrifying. He's, look, I possibly forgot... I, I did recall the um, knocking down, but I possibly forgot the drowning bit. And his personality is so charming and... You think he's int- charming? Well, I mean, he's just... I mean, but, that's why... That's why he's Ger- like, hey, I've got video of you fucking. But that's why <laughs> Gergé is interested in him, because he's mm. something different and... Is he that interested, though? Because Morim Skell's just inveigled himself around Gergé and then starts, um, you know, literally blackmailing him. He's definitely interested in him. There's a whole ch- section of the chapter where um, yeah. Chamul has a conversation with Gergé... Chamless. Ar- Chamless, sorry. Mm. Um, asking him why he likes him. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. And I just want to talk, though, about um, Morham Skell's um, mentor mind, gunboat diplomacy. I don't know if Banks... Because, you know, I mean, Banks does have late 20th century British um, views on some things. And the the term gunboat diplomacy from the, the 19th century was a bit of like, ho, 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 look at these natives. They, you know, you, you send a gunboat in and um, you can uh, change their government policy. But if you're on the receiving end of that... Yeah, it's not very diplomatic. <laughs> well, it, no, it's, it's, it's... Someone turns up with a technology that you can't compete with and says, we will kill everyone here. Yeah. Uh, and li- literally when the Americans opened up Japan with gunboat diplomacy with Commodore Perry's fleet, they took pictures of the um, bod- b- bombardment of Veracruz in Mexico and said, this is what we're going to do to you if you don't do what we want. Mm. Right? Um, you know, and so it's a... If you've got the upper hand, it's like, oh, we'll give him a bit of gun do- do- you know, gunboat diplomacy. If it's happening to you, your life is being destroyed. You're being told you have to grow um, cash crops instead of food for your people. It's it's a really awful colonial um, construct. Um, and I'm sure to some extent Banks knew exactly what he was doing when he put that name on mm. this. Um, but from the culture point of view, it's like, ho, 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 look at our great big ships. They're, you know, They terrify anyone they come in contact with. So what was your take on Gergé's efforts at uh, doing the cloak and dagger stuff? In what? Where he's like, oh, I'll get the orbital mind to um, help me secure my house and um, that'll keep the um, this nasty little drone out and um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll send a message in such a way that um, it'll flush out where this um, gunboat diplomacy ship is. Like, he's trying to be really clever and then it keeps turning out that um, certainly... Uh, gunboat diplomacy is miles ahead of him. To me, it seemed like another thing with Gergay not being very good at games. Yeah, well, I mean, he's definitely um, been entirely manipulated by um, both gunboat diplomacy and um, Moran Skell. Yeah. Because presumably that's all set up. To what extent do you think he's being manipulated by the rest of the culture minds to go on this mission? 
Well, I mean, they just Do respond. Do you think they're all so... sending each other messages, being like, "Oh, you turn up today and send him this message, and we'll give him a scare here." And um... I mean, you, you know, something's a little bit sus when Chamless, mm-hmm. who contacted them to say, "Come and talk to him." Yeah. Um, he's like very surprised how quickly it happened. Well, he says he's surprised. Do you, but do you think he's manipulating him? I wonder, because it's quite a coincidence that... Uh, Maybe they're, like, really good friends. Yeah, but he's just a meatbag. But I'm, I'm just saying it's an enormous coincidence that at the moment that the galaxy's greatest game player is feeling a little bored with life and looking for a challenge, that suddenly the, um, the culture needs um, to send the greatest game player in the galaxy to another galaxy to compete mm. in the game. When you said meatbag, <laughs> at one point, um, Marin Skell, doesn't he say that Chambliss is an insult meat mind? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I, I ha- it's left unsaid uh, to what extent all of these machines are um, collaborating to manipulate um, Gerge with, uh, while maintaining his sense of free will. Mm. Um, and in fact, I don't think their minds are leaving anything to chance. True. Yeah, it, it, there is a lot of coincidence mm. occurring. So there's a lot, I, th- I think there's a lot of kabuki theatre going on mm. with oh let, let's pretend to do this. Yeah. <laughs> and like um, Gerge treats the um, the orbital mind as if it's his servant mm. because that's what he's been brought up to do. That it's you know there to answer his every woman question. But you're talking about a um, a being of intelligence. Far, far, far exceeding Gerge's mm. uh, with its own wants, needs, and aspirations. And it's definitely achieved kudos within the culture for having produced this um, exceptional game player. Mm. Um, I would also note, you know, gaming culture and, you know, it, board games like Catan and Carcassonne um, didn't exist when this book was written. Yeah, right. Um, definitely, um, there were, um, complex board games and a, a lot of war games on the market in the eighties. Uh, and, and all of what we now think of as, um, you know, Euro style games. And, uh, I mean, we're literally sitting next to a shelf full of, um, awesome, cool, fun games that we should probably play more. Mm. Um, you know, but, um, it was a, a different world where, you know, chess was really the, the game that people thought of when they thought about playing games. Um, which we're going to have to talk about, Chess. Should we do that now? Or Oh, yeah, you did want to talk about that. I've done minimal reading on this topic. It's, but... it's, it's certainly lucky for us that this has turned up now um, because cheating is an unbelievable... And the stigma of cheating is a huge part of this chapter and particularly how the culture minds are manipulating Gergay into um, doing the things they want him to do. Um and, uh, you know, at the time, this is, sorry, the um, 3rd of October. Um, at this point in time, we've got a huge scandal in the world of chess with uh, Magnus Carlsen, the um, Norwegian Grandmaster, uh, accusing Hans Niemann of uh, cheating. Um, and uh, and he's, this is the really interesting thing for talking about the culture and um, culture minds and artificial intelligence, is that we've hit this point where... Um, artificial intelligence chess is uh, so much better than human chess that um, if you have the assistance of a computer, you will beat a human. Um, mm. the, the days of Gary Kasparov versus Deep Blue yeah. uh, <laughs> are, are long behind us. And, um, you know, even then Kasparov was struggling against um, against Deep Blue. Uh, and and there's, there's some weird things um, which the really young generation of players like Neiman, who's only 19... Um, they play more like computers because they play... Oh, because they're playing computers more often. That's right. Yeah. So um, stylistically, they're starting to pick up um, a lot of weird um, gambits that um, humans have never thought of. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things Carlson was saying when he thought that Neiman was cheating and the suggestion, and Elon Musk, who it should be noted, um, is a huge fan of this book in particular in the Culture series... Uh, also, um, I don't think he understands it though. Uh, anyway, Musk was the one who was saying, oh, maybe he was using vibrating anal beads to, um, have the move sent to him. Um, so then there's no suggestion of that. And Neiman said, well, I'll play naked to prove that I'm not cheating. Now, sorry, two things to point out for those who haven't been following this. Neiman has been caught cheating in the past. And this is where it comes into things like the stigma that Gerge is worried about with being caught cheating. Because once people think you might be cheating, they're all always going to think you're cheating when yeah. you're beating them. 
uh, if Neiman hadn't been found guilty of cheating in the past, um, but only ever in over computer, um, so online chess, uh, then he wouldn't have the same suggestions um, going around about him. Um, the other thing is that from Carlson's point of view, when he lost the opening game of this big tournament uh, last month um, to Neiman, uh, was that he said Neiman looked distracted, which is Magnus uh, alleging that the distraction was because he was getting these signals from something vibrating somewhere on his body. Um, and you don't beat Magnus Carlsen by being distracted in a game. Yeah. Um, it's quite funny. Like, chess players at that level, they burn like 500 calories in the course of a game. Just yeah, right, being, thinking. Just being hunched over the um, the, the table thinking. It's, uh, it's really wild. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so just in, in chess at the moment, we've, we've got this really interesting intersection of artificial intelligence uh, and cheating. Um, and, you know, is Carlson getting too old? 31 getting, is getting to be um, long in the tooth in, in chess world. Um, it, it's also worth noting, though, that Neiman, once they brought a 15-minute delay um, into the televisation of the games, um, then lost all, the other, uh, all but one of the other games he played in the tournament. Yeah, right. Which doesn't look good for you when you've no. gone from being able to beat the best in the world when it's being televised live and you can be getting signals back live to um, yeah. to suddenly being an ordinary player. Well, I mean, do not get me wrong. Hans Niemann would obliterate me um, in a game of chess. I'm not suggesting he's not a um, wildly gifted player. Um, I, uh, I merely suggest that it's really interesting and I don't... I don't think Carlson would be making these accusations if he didn't. He's, I'd just say he's better placed to judge it than me anyway. Mm. <laughs> yeah, really tough one. Um, okay. Uh, so Sheridan, you know, what do you think about this as ad? Well, I mean, they sound awful. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it's a matriarchal society. The women are in charge. Th- that is true. Um, but they're also like anally raping each other as prizes <laughs> for winning this game <laughs> in some sort of post-capitalist nightmare where instead of putting money on the table, they're like, well, offer your finger and then you were on an even playing field. Is, I mean, physical forfeits is an interesting concept because, you know, for instance, in, in poker games, if you've got a lot of money, you can just blast your opponent out. Yes. Um, so giving someone with a good hand the chance to, um, chuck a, a finger on the table metaphorically and, um, and keep playing in a way is evening it up, but you're still dealing with the, um, the effects of exploitative systems. Mm. Um, and obviously the person with bags of money doesn't need to risk body parts. Mm. Mm. So we're perpetuating exploitative systems. It's interesting too that, I mean, like the culture obviously doesn't really know they know a bit about this society, but they seem to want to just work out a way to control them. But to like, for what purpose, to what end, just to control everything. Yeah. I mean, this is the contradiction that banks constantly wrestles with, with contact, um, and special circumstances being is intervening in other people's destiny, um, ever justified. Um, what, what is and isn't worthwhile. And even let's say you can change the course of the empire of Azad because you've got these enormous computers trying to predict the future and, um, decide things. And, and let's say, okay, let, let, let's say earth is the, you know, the, the culture that the, the society that the culture is looking at, let's say they could put a pill in the water and um, we'd all stop being horrible to each other um, and um, share our wealth and um, live a more beautiful, harmonious society with a, uh, on a path to eventually joining the culture. Would that be a good thing for them to do? Or should we be left to be horrible to each other and figure it out for ourselves? Well, I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's almost the trolley car dilemma. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... What level of us being awful to each other does someone who has the moral capacity to change it have to, have to say this is too foul and we won't accept it? Mm. You don't don't have any thoughts on that, or um... well, I mean, I guess it's just 
like what's their motivation for doing it? They just don't like cruelty. I think a dislike of cruelty is a fair motivation for a lot of um, excellent people. Yeah, but I think we talked about this actually at the beginning of the last book, that there's actually a bit of a problem with the culture and it's sort of a bit of a part of the problem with Gergay and why he's so bored. Mm. It's because there's no suffering. Mm. He's Well, but the culture then says, well, he's bored. We'll give him some suffering. We'll get a drone to hold him down and drown him for a while. <laughs> well, that's, that has happened. <laughs> he, he does seem to be feeling a lot more, you know, alive. Uh, you know, and then they, um, you know, uh, tempt him with uh, cheating and then they threaten him with exposing his cheating and, um, you know, and then he's jetting across the gal- you know, intergalactic space to, um, to to play a game he's never played before. They've gone to a lot of lengths to uh, keep this little monkey entertained, haven't they? Even at the beginning of the book, um, Ye says to him when they're having that laser tag game, she was like, you were bored. I thought you'd like to shoot. Mm. Like as though that's some sort of like, the you know the the fake concept of being threatened to be killed would somehow mm. bring some excitement to his life. Yeah, obviously the the minds are better at entertaining than Yay is. Mm. But, um, yeah. Um. Do you think he would have gone if he hadn't been blackmailed? I think he might not have gone. Yeah. Same. Mm. Which, which is part of what makes me um, think this this whole thing is the minds quietly in cahoots. Mm. Um, you know, that, that meme of Leonardo DiCaprio and Wolf of Wall Street laughing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then he said... <laughs> yeah, I mean, Morim Skeld, he seems like a little such a sad little creature because he's such a horrible psychopath. He's funny, though. You think? Yeah, he makes lots of really good jokes. Oh, okay. But, you know, he's... Um, he really wants to go and slice up some um, enemies. He wants there to be enemies that he can go and do horrible things to, mm. which is, I don't know, not that nice. I don't know why he made the decision to cheat. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I sort of do, but... This, I mean, it was this is when really... he plays the, um, the big game against the, um, the kid off the um, general service yeah. vehicle that's come in. Um, I mean, there is a, a sort of... Yeah. anticipation that he's extremely threatened by her because when he hears about her, he says, he when he's talking to Chamless, I think, he mm. says, um, you know, I'm terrified of this young person being able to beat me. Mm. Um, it's an interesting one because he... The game's called Stricken, and we get a little sense of it. Obviously, it's not a real game uh, either, so Banks didn't have to fill in all the um, the pieces of it. But I did like the idea of, you know, this GSV, which is, you know, a population of a, a, is it millions, isn't it? Yeah. Um, comes into a, um, an orbital with a population in the, um, the many billions, and, um, but they've got a, a player who's really good at this game, so they want to see if that their player's as good as the, the, the player on the orbital. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, is our football team gonna, mm. gonna beat their football team? Um, and, um, obviously he wants to play the perfect game and be the first to do it. Cause no one's ever, um, no one in the cultures have done the, what is it? The web or something? Yeah. Well, just, the, you know, played the, the perfect, um, finish to the, to the get to the game basically. Um, and, uh, but it, I mean, basically, Morham Scale sucks him in by saying, oh, no one will ever know. And I did think it was naive of um, Gergé to put himself that much in uh, jeopardy to the drone. Oh, it's absolutely crazy. Like, I, yeah. I mean, he even says when they're talking about cheating, he's like, if you find it, if, if you're found out, I will kill myself. That's what he says. He's mm. like, I'm not messing around here. Mm. As though the drone would care. Yeah, well... I mean, the drone wants him to achieve things for it. Um, so if he just kills himself, then that, that's that's bad news for the drone. No, but I just felt like he f- fell into the trap a bit quickly. Like, mm-hmm. the drone offers him this cheating and he just sort of goes along with it without thinking, well, what does he want? Mm. Funny thing is, we never get inside the mind of the girl he's playing. No. Maybe she's got a drone that's feeding her moves. Maybe they've been um, setting them both up for this possibility. Uh, but, of course, but that can't be right, though, because the only reason Moran Scale's able to do it is because he was a 
contact unit yeah, the drone. So who still has some capabilities. And if yeah. he if there was another drone of, of his capability around, he would know. Cause yeah, he but I'm, says, I'm, I'm I'm saying from the um, the possibility this whole thing's been a culture setup, and it's been you know playing both sides of the um, of, of the game. Yeah. Uh, so that's total headcanon. There's no suggestion in the in the text that this is happening. That's it's more. Uh, I'm just trying to provide some agency to the other side, which is sadly lacking in it in the text. <laughs> I mean, she is going to lose. It's not like he's he just he just wants the flattery of getting the perfect game. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a moment to talk about tonight's whiskey. And Sheridan, this is the result of you uh, going to Fiji a few months ago, and um, you brought back two bottles of whiskey. And this is the second one. What have you got for us there? I have the Balvenie, which I feel like I should say with some sort of thick. No, that's okay. Scottish accent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is a triple cast. Cask. Oh, Mm -hmm. sorry. Cask. Mm -hmm. 12 year aged Scotch. It is. And it's funny because when um, Banks was writing this book in the 80s, Balvenie was quite unique. I don't know about unique, but certainly famous and unusual for using um, particularly sherry casks for aging their whiskies and getting flavours out of the casks. Mm. And in the years since, just as there's been an enormous explosion in board games, similarly, pretty much every um, aspirational new distillery in the world is grabbing weird casks and um, bedding down their whiskies in, in the cask. And in a way, it's a bit of a cheat in that your flavours coming from um, flavourings in the wood or even wood chips uh, rather than uh, what you're doing with your distilling. On the other hand... Um, Gee, it makes for a really nice whiskey. Mm, it's very tasty. Uh, when we did the um, Starwood whiskey right at the start of um, Player of Games, um, Starwood's an Australian distillery that uses um, a lot of funky um, barrels. Consider flavours, you mean? Sorry? When we did it at the start of Consider flavors. Yes, yeah. my apologies. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think on the label there it says, what this is a Speyside whiskey, Balvenie. Um, so it's um, down around Glasgow. Um, and... Um, what have we got in here? It is smooth and sweet. <laughs> Pass the bottle over. With elegant layers no, of re- you, spice you, and honeycomb. You're reading the wrong bit of the label. Oh, what, what do you want me to read? <laughs> Where the, what, what barrels it is. Oh. Uh, distinct cask types. Oloroso sherry butts. First fill bourbon bar- barrels and traditional whiskey casks. Ooh. Characterised by subtle spice and honeycomb. You know, if you'd asked me what the flavours were, I wouldn't have said subtle spice and honeycomb. But now that those words are in my head, I feel like I can definitely taste them. Each of the casks was hand-selected. Oh, yeah, they always do that. How else are they going to do it? (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, you you literally go through old casks that other, you know, the sherry makers don't want anymore, and you say, yeah, that one will hold whiskey, and oh, geez, that one's looking a bit manky. Uh Um, yeah. Anyway, tell me, what do you think of this one? It's very tasty. It's very, it is very smooth. Mm -hmm. Mm. How does it differ from other ones you've had? I think I need to get them all in a lineup to test them. Oh, you need to drink 15 whiskeys to really figure it out, do you? Um, That is literally how I got taught how to drink whiskey, actually. (laughs) (laughs) On a cold, wet night in Aberdeen. Um, Okay. So you had something you wanted to talk about this chapter. Well, I just, I couldn't work out if this section is extremely profound, but now feeling somewhat, maybe slightly juvenile given the, maybe it's my age, but also I feel like there's quite a broad discussion now in society about power structures and systems. Yep. But when, um... Werthel, who mm. is the second contact drone that mm-hmm. comes to speak to him, yep, is telling Gerge about Azad and is trying to explain why these three, you know, that these three sexes exist in it. Yep, that there's a dominant sex to which mm. Gerge responds to what, as mm. though he's shocked. Mm. Um, which I will say is a bit odd because the culture does also seem to have some sort of dominance with men. Does it? The most powerful human in consider Phlebas is a woman. Okay, pretty much everyone you meet in the culture in consider Phlebas is a woman. Yeah, maybe you're right. Anyway. Um, 
and to which the drone says, the dominant sex, empires are synonymous with centralised, if occasionally schismatised, hierarchical power structures in which influence is restricted to an economically privileged class retaining its advantage through usually a judicious use of oppression and skilled manipulation of both the society's information dissemination and its lesser, as a rule, nominally independent power systems. In short, it's all about dominance. Yeah. I mean, it's that's actually quite a good summary of... Of where we are in the world today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, look. It's one of the things because Banks, with his writing about the culture, is saying this is what life could be like if there was no more scarcity, and from so many things in our lives, scarcity is disappearing. Mm. For example, when this book was written, um, you used to have to pay quite a lot of good money to get a new album from a band you liked, mm. and you couldn't listen to all the music you wanted. You had to make choices about which album you were going to buy in a week. Yeah, I can remember it used to be I'd buy myself a new book and a new album. Um, and one case of beer was quite... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and, um, and now um, books are still a little um, metered, although, you know, it costs 12 bucks for a book on Amazon. And it'll take I mean, you, you still, you can get a e-book, e-books from libraries now, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and definitely, I mean, music is, uh, you know, it's been a shame for what's happened to the artists, um, but um, you can listen to any band pretty much that, in the world all the time. I mean, uh, you can listen to, yeah, you can, for the same price as for a whole year of two C, two or three CDs. What do you view the price as? A Spotify membership. You is... don't need to pay for Spotify if you're willing to accept Tr- some ads. You True. Can, yeah. Or, you know, YouTube uh, yeah. music as well. Uh, yeah. Um, so scarcity is disappearing. And, you know, we, we see that in lots of other things that are becoming outrageously cheap. I mean, the fact you can buy a cheap um, mobile phone that lets you access pretty much all the information in the world for $200 and it would have been a, um, a device without price 20 years ago. Yeah. But you do now have to sell your firstborn child and to get buy a house. <laughs> yeah. Real estate isn't getting cheaper. I'll give you that. Um, but um, it's... So Banks is giving us this vision of this is what the world can be like when there's as much stuff as anyone could ever want. Mm. Um, and and then how do you arrange society in that way and con- compare and contrast to other societies where they create artificial scarcity of things that don't even need to be scarce simply so that some dominant people at the top can have more stuff and feel more special mm. um, than others. I mean, you know, uh, every country's got them, but, you know, the billionaires in this country um, contribute very little for the enormous wealth they hold. Mm. Um, yeah, but no, that that um, paragraph I highlighted, that one as well, um, really does give you an outline of where Banks is trying to get to with this culture stuff. And it's weirdly ironic that this is the book that Jeff Bezos and... Um, Elon Musk love because they're like I am the player of games. <laughs> Elon Musk named two of his SpaceX spacecraft so after two GSVs from the book. Yeah, two of the ships, yeah. Oh, ships. Yeah, uh, yes, he did. Uh, he really, really likes it. And I'm like, did you really read it, Elon? Did Did you understand? Yeah, so- and also, Gergay's such a callow, um, you know, in many ways, failure of a human being. <laughs> but they're like, yeah, I'm awesome. I'm a player of games. <laughs> Yeah, right. They really missed the message, didn't they? Mm. Although I guess they did that with well, swimming in their billions. Uh, yeah, there is that. Other than that, I mean, it's such a long chapter, we can't do our usual thing of doing detailed readings of lines. I guess I, I, I started with this question. I'm going to come back to it now for you, because um, this is your first time seeing what it's like to live in the culture. Hmm. So what, what what did you take away from that? What did you think about it? Well, I thought the same as what I did, or similar to what I did in the first one, which is that they're all a bit bored because they've got everything that they need. Mm. And that if you deprive yourself of suffering, which is an innately human condition, then you're not very happy. Right. How much suffering do you want? Just a little bit. 
How much suffering do you want to inflict on other people? I mean, I guess he does suffer in... He has to learn the games and practice the games and... You've got to do work to excel at things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, that is an element of suffering. Like, it can't all be 100% interesting. Mm. And I think in an environment where everyone has um, unlimited time to practice things, getting to a point where you're well known for being good at something would require an awful lot of dedication. Yeah. Yeah. All right, then. So, who is your hero of the... Um... Oh, easy peasy. Oh, yeah. Who do you think I'm going to pick? Yay. No. No. <laughs> Marin Skell. Yeah, you, you, you're weirdly positive on that horrible little monster. It's funny. All right, okay. <laughs> you can actually be quite the a-hole if you're just funny. Yeah, right. I mean, I've pretty much lived my whole life that way. Yeah, right. But okay. I'm not a full a-hole and I'm not that mm-hmm. funny. <laughs> okay. And did you have a favourite ship name? There were quite a few in this chapter. Oh, there were. I wasn't... Let me have a little scroll through. Mm-hmm. GSV, little rascal. You um didn't tell me you were going to ask me this. Mm. It's a standing question. Gunboat diplomacy. I think I'm going to go unfortunate conflict of evidence. Okay, what do you like about that one? Well, it's, it's one, it sounds a bit judicial or legal. Mm-hmm. Having been a former lawyer. Yep. So the conflict of evidence one would usually think of as well. Mm. It's getting to the, the truth of something. Mm-hmm. Um, but is there ever a fortunate conflict of evidence? Because <laughs> you can't get to the truth that way. <laughs> there is, when I said conflict of evidence, what I was actually thinking, and I know you're talking about the legal sense, which is entirely valid, but, you know, there is... In organisations, you'll have people who build up ideas that don't have any basis in reality, and then their little dream worlds will come into conflict with actual evidence. And uh, oh, and, okay. So you were you were thinking something that was sort of fantastical, contra- conflicting with something truthful. Yeah. Whereas I was thinking of two truths that mm. conflict. Yeah. Um, mm. And and. I mean, if you have two truths that conflict, to me, that's always unfortunate because you can't get to the truth. Yeah. Um, mm. yeah. I did like that the um, the limiting factor, the ship that he's going to be on um, for this long journey to the uh, Magellanic Cloud, which is basically another galaxy, uh, little ones, but still other galaxies, uh, is a murderer-class g- general offence unit left over from the Enduran War. That's, that's the culture... Oh, I missed that reference. That's the, that's the culture in the Adiran War, getting past being cute about things. What are we going to call this? Murderer. <laughs> what does it do? Murders things. <laughs> what was your favourite ship name? Oh, probably Gunboat Diplomacy, just because it's just such a loaded term, weighed down with um, horror. What, are, what were the um, ships that Elon Musk used? Um, just read the instructions? Mm-hmm. And, of course, I still love you. Oh, when you know that must love life, that's so sleazy. That that must be later in the book. I am looking at the Wikipedia page. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Just read the instructions is quite humorous. Yeah. He named autonomous spaceport drone ships those. Yeah, so they're, they're big... Oh, they're bar- quite... They're big barges. Crazy looking things. Well, that's what you're looking at is a barge that goes out and then the rocket lands on the barge. Yeah, right. Or lands on the barge or goes off. From no, it the lands barge. on the barge. How does it land on the barge? That's, that's the whole thing about what Elon Musk's doing that's so clever is he's making his rockets so they can come down and land themselves. That sounds dangerous. Well, that's why he needs a barge to do it offshore so it doesn't blow anything up if it goes wrong. But can't he also just land them wherever he wants? Yeah, but people get upset about someone trying to land a rocket next to their house. Yeah, but I would have thought that that's a good way to invade something. Well, it's, anyway, it's, it's, so he's got barges named after um, culture ships. Um, yes, but he's still an awful human being um, who came by his money badly. But he is revolutionizing, revolutionizing humanity in many good ways, so he's uh, there's going to be a lot of books written about Elon Musk. <laughs> mm. They're probably going to sell more than Flare of Games as well. But, uh, yep. Okay, on that note, um, I think we might call this one a day. Everyone get cracking on um, Chapter 2. Should and, be back in about two years. And we'll be back with you, hopefully, <laughs> um, in a month or so. Uh, <laughs> okay, and on that, we're going to go watch House of the Dragon. Mm-hmm.